Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Kathy Fecky. Thanks for being on the show, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm honored to have you on the show, Kathy. Kathy's a co-CEO of Real Wealth Network and best-selling author of Retire Rich with Rentals, an active real estate investor, licensed real estate agent, and former mortgage broker specializing in helping people build multi-million dollar real estate portfolios that generate passive monthly cash flow for life. She's a frequent guest expert on CNN, CNBC, Fox, Bloomberg, NPR, CBS, Market Watch, and the Wall Street Journal, and now also the Real Estate Syndication Show. <laughs> also <laughs> named among top 100 most intriguing entrepreneurs by Goldman Sachs two years in a row. She hosts two podcasts. I can't imagine doing that, but she hosts two podcasts, The Real Wealth Show and The Real Estate News for Investors, both top 10 podcasts on iTunes for listeners in 133 different uh, countries. Her company, Real World Wealth Network, offers free resources and cutting edge education for beginners and experienced real estate investors. Kathy is passionate about teaching others how to create real wealth, which she defines as having both the time and the money to live her life, live your life on, on your terms. I appreciate, appreciate that, Kathy. That sounds amazing. And thank you again. <laughs> and in case the listeners haven't heard of you, give us a little bit more about who you are, where you are, and, and let's, let's dive in. Sure. I mean, probably, uh, what, 15 years ago, I was just starting out. So I, I didn't know anything about real estate. So you, you know, you got to start somewhere. Uh, 15 years later, I am the, as you said, the co-CEO of Real Wealth Network. We have over 42,000 members. We've raised over 120 million for different syndications, ranging from multifamily to land development to private lending. Uh, even a resort in Costa Rica. So, um, wow. you know, we've done a lot of really, really great things. Some have just been total out of the park, 40% return type deals and others, not so much. So, uh, you know, we've been through a, a downturn that hit Rich and I really hard. We've done some syndications that were really hard. So, um, I, I could talk about the good ones all day long, but maybe learning from the bad ones is is uh, what people need to hear. Yeah, and and I've heard I've heard one of your stories, and I've heard the story about you and Rich, and it's just amazing. I would love to hear it, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to hear it. It's just every amazing story, unfortunately. Um, well, you can read it in my book. It's the opening awesome. chapter, one chapter. You'll read it in ten minutes. At Retire rich with rentals. Just kind of what got us us started when I was really shopping for my kids at uh, garage sales. And <laughs> so like, I know what it's like to struggle and to, you know, try to build something from nothing and then build it and then lose it and build it back. So, you know, again, lots, I've got lots of years of experience now. And I would highly recommend it. And I've seen you and Rich at, uh, at the conference in Denver, Joe Farrellis's best ever conference. And, and yeah, just an amazing story. Uh, but Kathy, you know, you and Rich have created such an amazing business and, and had success and, and y'all are doing so well uh, and are, are just experts in this field. I know everyone looks up to you all and, and just for your expertise and advice. And, and I really would love for you, to ha you know, for us to talk about just how you're approaching the market uh, mm -hmm. to make sure your investors are taken care of. You know, everybody says in the, the, uh, the quote, you know, the market end quote, you know, the way it is and all these things. Mm -hmm. And I'd just love to hear your opinion, economic outlook type. You know, nobody really knows. That's the bottom line. We, we do know one thing. This is the longest expansion in history. And that's really the only facts we have. Uh, we don't know if it's going to continue to expand. We don't know if we've got a recession around the corner. Uh, some people will argue all day long that, that the expansion is going to continue for years to come. Others will say that, you know, we're going to see a downturn and we're already in it. So the bottom line is when uh, I, I've been through a downturn, I can assure you it is difficult. I don't think that, uh, I don't think that housing it, itself is going to necessarily, it won't be the cause of a recession for sure, because the loans that have been given in the past 10 years have been very, very solid. Uh, the prices have gone up. People are locked into low rates. It's more expensive to rent than to, than to own a property. So 
People aren't going to be walking away from a bunch of equity low rates just to pay higher rents. You know, that's, that's not going to happen. So I don't see a housing crisis. However, we have a massive debt crisis in this country that is out of control. Again, Warren Buffett says, don't worry about it. So maybe you shouldn't worry about it. But either way, back in 2008, or I should say starting in 2006, we had a pretty good idea something was wrong. And nobody really knew how that was going to blow up. Like most people had no idea. But because I had my Real Wealth show on iTunes, I could interview people like Robert Kiyosaki and learn a lot. And basically, when you're in an uncertain time, we're not at the beginning of a boom market. Like I think everyone can agree on that. So when you're in somewhat uncertain times, then you just, you have to be a little more careful and you can still invest. You can invest uh, aggressively, but with, with different parameters in place. So for example, back in 2006, again, we had... I'm based in the Silicon Valley of California, lots and lots of money, um, but people don't have a clue about investing. So people were buying at the top of the market. They weren't looking at cash flows. I have, I've had people come to me and say, hey, I bought a fourplex in Berkeley for $2 million. Do you think that's a good investment? I would say, well, what's the cash flow? And they'd say, I'm not sure. What, what do you mean by that? Oh. So. You know, that's the type of thing you don't want to be doing is buying at the top, having no clue about what you're doing. You need to be educated. So, um, so back then we were helping people sell those bubble properties or those properties that wouldn't perform so well in a down market and acquire properties, high cash flow properties and market where jobs were going, where there was population growth. And at the time that was Dallas, Texas for sure. So we helped thousands of people sell their investment properties in California at the peak and 1031 exchanged them to Texas where that boom hadn't happened yet, but we saw the jobs and the population and the, the, the property prices were so low. You could quintuple your cash flow, get way more for your money in Dallas and be more diversified so that when that downturn came, I'm telling you, most of our investors didn't even feel it. Their net worth was not affected. If anything, it grew. Their cash flows grew. So they rode through that 2008, 2009, you know, world economic collapse without even feeling it. Wow. Now, if there hadn't been a collapse, they would have done just fine too. So that's, that's kind of what to look at these days is how do I move forward buying things that are going to hold up no matter what? So again, the, th the keys I said is follow the jobs. Follow the population and the cash flow. And I would add a fourth to that low leverage. Like if you can stay low leverage, because you know what? Even if you do all those things right, but you over leverage and maybe rents go down just a little, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Wow. And, <laughs> you know, you know, we're talking about 2006. You knew something, you know, you just felt something was wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So you started to act. And, and how do you comp compare that feeling to, to, to now? Uh, very similar. It's a, we have a debt problem. Back then, it was a mortgage debt pro problem. Today, it's a corporate debt and national debt problem and kind of credit card and student loan debt. It's not, ho it's not housing. We're not the culprits this time. We're actually the good guys in the game. Like the people in housing, um, except for some multifamily people, but single family, for the most part, man, you had to qualify. You had to put money down. You had to prove you can pay it back. Um, in multifamily, I would say that there's people who are over leveraged and that concerns me today. So uh, if, if there is a housing collapse, I think it could hit certain multifamily investors harder than others. People who just, again, I, I see a lot of young people jumping in. They don't have the experience and they don't, um, uh, they're building. So they think, oh boy, I'm going to leverage to the hilt. Uh, but what they have to understand is if they're syndicating and using others, other people's money, don't, don't practice on other people's money. Mm. Keep their money safe first and foremost, because for them, that may, may, maybe that is their retirement. And you don't want to wake up one day having lost everybody's retirement. So. You know, you mentioned like having to be educated. And I wanted to ask you, how did you educate yourself? You know, and, and maybe how do you recommend people educate themselves now so we understand the market and are, and are prepared? Sure. Um, I would get my advice from old dudes. That's the best way I could say it. Like, and women, you know, people that, uh, that have been through several cycles. There's a lot of people who are getting uh, their education from quote unquote gurus today that have only literally been in the business for three years or four years. I'm not saying they're not good investors. I'm just saying 
they don't have the experience necessarily that someone with 20, 30, 40 years experience would have. So if, you, if you're working with anybody at all, whether you're joining someone else's syndication or syndicating yourself, make sure you have that wise person of experience on your board, you know, your board of directors or as an advisor, as part of your team, maybe just give them a little section, a, a little, you know, some shares or units in the project so that they're there to help guide you through the process. Um, that, that would be key. Um, that's with any of our deals. I mean, we do land development, subdivision, we're building subdivisions, build to rent communities all across the country. And I don't know I don't know how to do that, but I've got partners who do, you know, I've, nice. I've got, like I said, people have done it for 30, 40 years who have an amazing track record. So I think to, to compare it, like, again, to 2008, or I should say 2006 to now, um, there, there's a lot of debt that is going to come, it's going to come due at some point. And, and whether it's corporations who are going to have to downsize and that could cost uh, job losses or these pensions that can't be paid and people aren't going to have the retirement they thought they were going to have. Um, that kind of crisis, it's going to be very serious, but again, it doesn't necessarily mean it will affect the housing or rental market. If anything, it'll make the rental market stronger. You just have to make sure you have the right product. You, so you don't want, again, don't be over leveraged. Don't, you don't want to be on any extreme. In my opinion, if you're in a class, well, if there's a recession, people can't maybe afford A class. So they're going to move to B. If you're in the real nasty part of town, uh, that's high crime. Well, guess what? During a recession, maybe maybe those tenants can afford to move up. And uh, and so yeah, the the extremes. I wouldn't go too lo low end. I wouldn't go too high end. Definitely be careful about market saturation. Make sure you understand units coming online because at the end of the day, it always comes down to supply and demand. If there's too much supply your rents are going to go down and that's going to be painful. Is so, there something yeah. specifically you use to determine the market saturation and, and where you feel comfortable? I would just make sure you have very good relationships with local brokers. Brokers will be able to pull reports. Um, you know, just your, your regular places where you get your data for your multifamily. Uh, you want to make sure that you understand permits and what's being built in the area in single and multifamily. Because again, you know, overbuilding, and, and we're seeing a little bit of that in, in certain parts of Dallas, certain parts of New York, Seattle, uh, even San Francisco and LA, uh, just there's a lot of units coming online. It's taken 10 years for it to happen. So they're, they're just now coming online. So you can, you can go to your local planning commission and find right. out, you know, but, um, you know, whatever resources you subscribe to when doing your research on multifamily, just... Again, make sure that that's one of the, the data points that you look for. Okay. Okay. Any other ways you're approaching the market to make sure that you know, your investors are taken care of? Yeah, absolutely. So there's huge gains in land development, whether you're building apartments or single family homes or whatever you're building. Uh, so we, we've been buying land, entitling it, and either selling the entitled lots or building the houses and selling them. And that could be considered high risk because anytime you build anything, you're somewhat at the mercy of the local planning commission and, and those people are politicians and they change. So one year you might have your approvals or you think you have your approvals from, you know, the, the, the board, the, the supervisors that say, all right, I'm, yeah, am I saying that? the politicians who got elected, maybe they want, maybe they're pro growth, but then the next round of politicians, maybe they're in slow growth and they might not like your project anymore. So it's very, very risky anytime you build. Um, so the, the way that we mitigate that risk is number one, we, we pay very high preferred returns. So, because I want my developer partners to know that our investors get paid first. They get paid last. They don't get developer fees, nothing. They get paid at the end when it's done. And investors, our investors get as much as a 15% preferred return because I want to know, hey, if this project goes over budget or takes longer, the investors are getting paid, not you. Wow. Get paid at the end is the developer. So that's that's number one. And, and I've heard I've heard of numerous people say that with like any type of development, there may not be a preferred return or maybe, you know, many years, obviously. Well, and that's that's okay. But for me, uh, I just don't bring me a project unless you're confident enough. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anyone should be making less than 15% on a, on a development because it is risky. So, you know, if, if you can't bring me a project that promises that, then 
you know, so that does, so put your, your money on the line there. And that is like, like first dollars out, go to the investors. If I don't finish this thing in time or it goes up under over budget, it comes out of the developer profit, not the investor. Well, that's, that's just how we protect the investors. But then on top, and it's, it's probably too much, maybe, maybe 12% would be okay. But you know, these people are putting up their money to make this happen. They should be rewarded uh, first and foremost. So that's one. Second, and this may seem extremely shocking to you, but we, we don't take on debt. Because wow. the number one reason that so many builders went into bankruptcy and lost all everything, they lost their land, they lost their projects, banks foreclosed, even if they had good projects, banks failed and they couldn't finish them because their construction loans just disappeared, even though they were paying, they were doing everything right, but the banks failed. There was no money. So the reason that builders got absolutely wiped out was because of debt. Because what happens is the lender is looking, when, when a lender lends on a construction project, they're tough. And if you're not selling at a certain sales pace, if, if, if you're not getting things done on time, they will foreclose on you. So we raise, I'll give you an example. This was a very cool project. Um, we, uh, my developer partner found some lots in Reno, very difficult. Reno, Nevada has massive job growth. So we're excited about that market. We somehow found land, and guess what? We found land from another group who had leverage. They got a hard money loan. Their entitlement didn't happen as quickly. They were about to get foreclosed on, and guess who came in and scooped it up? We did <laughs> wow. because they were distressed, right? Distressed sellers. So we I'm happy to sell it. it. Yeah. We managed to get this amazing land already close to entitlement. They'd done all the work. We got it for at cost, and uh, and then- we raised, we needed to raise about $12.5 million to do that, to acquire the land. Um, and we didn't want any bank financing. So then we finished out the lots, which didn't need much work. And we sold half the lots for $12 million. So for the same price that we acquired the whole thing, we now own half the lots free and clear. And then we built, we raised a, a little bit more money just to build the first phase and then the, the income from that first phase and sales goes to fund the next phase, the next phase, so forth. So, um, so there's no bank debt. There's no risk there uh, from that perspective. No, no one can foreclose on us. You can sleep a lot easier at night. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so huge gains in land development. I, and I appreciate you elaborating on that. And is that your all's focus now mostly is the land development? We just like deals, you know, we just like deals. I don't like, I, I did a, I had a, just a bad, bad experience with a multifamily. So I'm, I'm real cautious. I, I, we have very strict guidelines, so it's hard for me to find what I want, but we, we are looking at some multifamily and opportunity zones. And we do have a 250 unit building in Mountain View, California, across from Google, um, that's a, a whopping one cap. We raised oh. a lot. I mean, like what? Uh, the whole point was it's across from Google and we can increase density to 800 units from the 200. So we just got the approvals for that. And, and, uh, and so that, that's gone well. But the 92 unit that we owned in Indiana, it was difficult. It was an older building. It was fully leased out. Everything looked good. It was fully leased out. But um, because it was an older building, a gas pipe blew in the middle of the night. The city forced us to have everyone leave. So we went from like 98% occupied to zero over, literally overnight. And then the city required all kinds of, they, they didn't want the liability. So we had to really just replace everything. This was not in the, <laughs> in the budget. And uh, it, was, it was hard. It was a really hard thing. So I'm, I'm real careful about buying buildings that are too old um, or the, the CapEx. I just, yeah. Yeah. It, it could be challenging. So we look at um, more B class, 250 units or more uh, that can really still work with about a 65% leverage. So hard to find. Nice. A any other yeah. buying criteria that you all have, that, you know, that you're so strict about? I'd love to hear that if you're, if what you can share. Yeah. Cause you know, you got to understand when, when you start syndicating, you're dealing with people with money. You're not dealing with people. The person, the syndicator may be trying to build wealth, but the money you're getting to syndicate is from people who have money That's and right. people who have money don't want to lose their money. They want to protect their money. That's the most important thing, protection. And then 
cash flow after that, and then equity gro- growth after that. So when you can really understand the mindset of the investor who's putting their money up and saying, I'm not going to take these high returns in the stock market because I don't want that volatility. I want something stable. When you, when you can really understand what they're looking for, then you can structure your deal and you can come up with your parameters. You might just, maybe, maybe they just want to lend you the money secured against the property and first lien position at a low LTV. Maybe that's safe. We've done a lot of deals like that where it's like, look, we understand this is risky, but we know this property is worth $5 million. So we're looking for 3 million just secured as a a lien. You know, Uh, that's, that's a pretty safe deal. And then you could pay less because they don't need as much um, if they're secured that way. Uh, But if we're, if we're going to do a, a, again, a, I prefer to build apartments just because I like the newer and there's, there's more upside there. Uh, But if we're going to do a deep value add, I want someone with lots of experience (laughs) there to help me out. And like I said, it has to work at a 65% LTV, which is again, tough. It's tough. Very. So, (laughs) so what's been, I know you've done numerous deal, I mean, over your career now, but what's been the hardest part of the syndication business specifically for you? Um, Right now, so everybody has their gift, right? My gift is that I've been doing this for a long time. I've had my Real Wealth show for years. I had a big show in in, um, San Francisco on a major station there. And I've been a regular guest expert on national media. So I have a following and a very large investor network. So the raising money part is just so easy. It's sometimes one email and it's done. and a lot of times that's the case. If I have to, sometimes I actually have to do a full presentation in a live event in itself. So raising the money, totally easy. Um, the hard part for me now is, is finding the team and the deal that makes sense in today's environment. And there's only a few people I trust. We have people presenting us deals every day, all day. So in all honesty, I could use uh, a really great real estate expert to look at these deals within our team because we're getting a little bogged down with so many deals that come in. We could definitely use that um, real estate expert. Then once you found the good deal, you know, carving it out, like what do the investors get? What is the, you know, what do the operators get? I wouldn't say that's the hard part, but you have to make sure first and foremost that the investors like it. Then you got to make sure the operator likes it and there's got to be something left for you. Uh, so but but really for us the the we we need those real estate experts on our team because we're we're growing quickly. And is there a way that you've recently improved your all's business that we could all apply to ours? Oh my gosh, we're doing we're constantly constantly improving. But and you've probably heard this a million times from other guests. We're doing EOS, um, the traction. If you mm-hmm. read traction, and it's really a pain. I don't like it. My husband, my co CEO Rich, he thinks it's awesome. I don't like it, but it's, it's one of those things where you have to sit down for a full day with your leadership team and go through this entrepreneurial operating system called EOS. Just read the book Traction to get an idea. A book that kind of goes along with that is called Rocket Fuel, and that will really help couples or partners who are different. And most partners and couples are different usually have the more the risk taker the the more aggressive one and then you have the conservative one that is a combination known as rocket fuel when you get that right and you use each other's skills i'm the one who's more aggressive my husband is more analytical and and so i'm the visionary but then my visions have to go through a filter that he you know that we have set and it it really helps so rocket fuel read that and traction and then finally, just developing leaders. We learned that, uh, I think it was at uh, Infusionsoft's Elite Forum, the, the message they said is develop about five, four or five leaders in your company. And that's where all of your energy goes. And you put them through training and you help them grow so that then they have three to five people under them. And you're, all you're dealing with is that is the leadership team and then training them so that they can then train their people so you don't have everyone calling you when you run the company, you only have your leaders and everyone else should be calling them. (laughs) Yeah. So what's the, if you could say there, there's one thing that's contributed to your success, uh, what, what, what is that? Uh, I would say, 
uh, the things that did not contribute to my success were jumping into things I didn't understand. Mm. The things that are contributing now is that I am probably, I'm older, so I'm more conservative and probably to the point where it's very annoying to people. But now I'm that person who is just not willing to take unnecessary risks. I mean, we're still doing tons of deals and we're still raising lots of money and we're, we're, we're aggressive, but I now ask questions I wouldn't have known to ask before. And I, I mean, I see so many synd- people doing syndications who are l- absolutely breaking laws left and right. So understand, you know, take the time to hire that attorney. You're in SEC territory. You don't want to break security law. Have a good attorney. Uh, don't just find some documents that you used on a different deal. No, 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 no. You got to do it right. You got to have the right attorney who really understands securities in this business. And is there anything else, you know, to obviously our, you know, most of our listeners are aspiring syndicators are getting into this business. Anything else that, uh, you know, from your experience that you would add to them uh, just to help them to be set on the right path? Yeah. I'm um, just know your strengths. I, I, my husband and I are really good marketers. So syndicating and raising money is really easy for us. The, you know, underwriting the deal is not as easy. So for us, we have to find those underwriters and those real estate experts to compliment us. If you're, if you're an amazing underwriter, then you need that marketing person or you need, you need whoever, whatever you're not. And, and it needs to be the best in the business. So don't think that if you're an amazing analyst and underwriter that you're also maybe going to mag- magically be a great marketer. Pro- you're probably not. Um, you might be, but just know that, you know, know what you're good at and hire the people that are good at things that you're not good at. Kathy, you know, before we have to go, tell the listeners how you like to give back. Oh my gosh, we have a wonderful giving program, uh, 10% of the company profits to four different, um, you know, four different charities that we just love. And one of them is, is in Indiana that um, helps these kind of, it's not sexy at all. And it's, it's, it's hard. These are kids who have been terribly abused. Um, these, these are the kind of the forgotten children and, uh, and, and it's, it's tough, but we, we donate a lot to them. Wow. Is, is there a name? Is that the name of the organization? Forgotten you know, I was just totally spacing on the name of it. I, I, okay. Okay. I'll try to remember it. Send it's it to on. me. We'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Perfect. All right, Kathy. Well, thank you so much for your time, Kathy. I'm honored to have you on the show and uh, tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and get in touch with you. Sure. Realwealthnetwork.com. Real as in real estate, wealth and your, as in your money and network as the network we have nationwide, uh, finding great deals for our members. Uh, you can join for free at, re- at realwealthnetwork.com and find out um, if you join, then you can find out about our different syndications and projects going on. There's tons of educational materials there. And then of course, uh, Retire Rich with Rentals is on Amazon. Nice. Thank you again, Kathy. I also appreciate the listeners being with us today and every day. And I hope you'll go to LifeBridge Capital and connect with me. Also go to the Facebook group, The Real Estate Syndication Show. And we will talk to each of you tomorrow. Bye. (laughs) Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.